Dr. Stefan Wess is the CEO of Empolis Information Management. is a leading software company based in Germany. His specialty is artificial intelligence. He has a vast international industry experience. And uh, uh, so let's hear from him about uh, data-driven healthcare. Dr. Wess, welcome to the Brain Forum. And I think you need this course. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you for inviting me to the organizers and especially to Dr. Chufali. So, um, in the first time of history, a computer was able to beat two human champions in a game which is called Jeopardy. This was transmitted live on TV and it was a big victory. Why I'm, I'm so amazed about it because we all know that computer can do a lot of things. But from a computer scientist's point of view, a lot of these tasks are not really complicated. Computers are built to do these, these kind of tasks. But really winning against human champions in an open world question and answer game was really an achievement. So we truly all live in the area of smart machines. But not only in the area of smart machines, if we look at these numbers. So at that point in time, there are about 1.5 billion smartphones on the planet. And these smartphones are growing so fast that they grow 10 times faster than all the personal computers in the 80s. They speed up twice as fast as all the internet users in the 90s and three times faster than all the social networks. So smartphones is the fastest adapted technology in the history of mankind. But smartphones are only the beginning. We heard a lot about all these wearable devices. It will be very soon that everybody will wear these kind of smart watches. There are activity trackers out there who track our physical activities. We might wear Google Classes. So a real revolution is going on. And ending all this will be in something we call the Internet of Things, where everything is connected to every other thing. So healthcare might be connected to retail, and the cars might be connected to communications. Every piece we own might communicate to every other piece. This kind of digital revolution creates huge amount of data. So research really estimates that in 2016, we will have 4.1 terabytes of data. This is really difficult to understand. So let me give that little example. You all know that computer pictures are made out of these little pixels. So if one pixel would be around 1,000 gigabytes, this is a terabyte, then we have 1,000 terabytes, which is a petabyte, and 1 million terabytes is an exabyte, and 1 billion terabytes leading to this cube. That would be just one third of all the data which is generated in 2016. So scientists have estimated that mankind has created five exabytes of data in the first 2,000 years. So that was all data really generated by the whole mankind in that time. In 2011, we needed two days to create the same amount of data. And today, why I'm talking in 10 minutes, whole mankind is creating more data than we did in the 2,000 years before. So that is really the digital revolution which is ongoing. Are we able to handle this real amount of data, this big, big data wave really coming? And the answer is yes. And to convince you, I also brought a little example with me. So think about you have one billion pages of printed paper. So if you extract all the formatting and all the graphics, we talk about four kilobytes of data per page. If it would be a bookshelf, just to give you an estimation, really that bookshelf would be around 100 kilometers long. So to store that information, 
we need about, let's say, four terabyte to store that information on the hard drive and to read it. It would take about one and a half days just to read that data, not to process it, just to read it. Now, really of today, these new technologies, which are called, for example, in-memory computing, we are able to read all that data in just 15 minutes. So we are close to process that data in real time, not waiting a day really to get the results. So we have the data. It's all created by these smart devices. We are able to process. Last question, can we really afford that? How expensive is it? Here I also brought some numbers. If you would bought the storage of 4 terabyte in 2002, it would cost you about $600,000. In 2007, $100,000. In 2012, $20,000. So if you want, you can really do that at home. OK, we have that data. Where's the issue? The real challenge is how to get insights into that unstructured data. What does this have to do with healthcare? So McKinsey made a big study about really the impact of big data. And as far as I know, this yeah, the sentence that data is the oil of the 21st century is also out of that report. And they investigated different areas, and they also investigated healthcare. Where are these, these kind of data pools in healthcare? We have heard it. There's a lot of data in the R&D. There's a lot of data in the clinics. We have, of course, money is important, all this activity and cost claim data. And last but not least, also the patient behavior data and the sentiment data. All these data pools need to be integrated somehow. What is the economical benefit of this? They did also a study on that, and the estimation is that if we use that kind of technology, we might save around $300 billion, billion dollars a year. And they said, where is the biggest impact? Of course, there's an impact of about $100 million in the R&D, but the biggest impact for the use of big data is in the clinical operations area. What do we need to analyze these kind of patient records? Obviously, these patient records, they consist about images, they have sentences, they have numerical values like the blood pressure or the temperature. And the question is, if we want to process all this information automatically, we obviously need a lot of different technologies to get all, all that information processed. Image processing, rule base, a lot of things. Have we heard about it? I would like get to dive in into two specific technologies more deeply. First, of course, you saw it, there's a lot of written text on a patient record. You need to understand the language. So language understanding and natural language processing is a key technology to make that data available. Just an example. So if you have a sentence like, Roche he does not invent and in manufacturing in Switzerland, a five-year schoolboy is able to tell what is the subject, what is the object, the syntax we learn in school. Computers have no clue about it, for this is just symbols. And to get a little bit more complex, if we look on the second sentence, and we just see there is a sentence, and there are three persons mentioned in the sentence, and we have a date and we have a venue, might be a meeting after that they taking place. So we can use that kind of technology to scan these patient information and mark the relevant parts of the text to use that for further processing. The second technology, and that's my specific research area, is called case-based reasoning. It's very complicated, but I want really to keep it easy, and I have brought with me three pictures. Yeah, think about you go to a garage and you have a problem with your car. You have never seen that problem really before, so you go to an expert. This is the expert. This is the guy with the hat. Why is he an expert in that? Not only because he wears the hat, but he has some experience. 
He has seen a lot of different cases of broken cars, and when he sees my car, he gets remembered that he has seen a similar situation before. This one. So it's not exactly the same car, but it seems that the failure is similar. So what does he do? He uses that experience, he repairs my car, and he learned. He got new experience. And in fact, you are all doctors. This kind of work is very similar to that what doctors very often do. So case-based reasoning is a technology to solve new problems by reusing known cases. You retrieve similar cases, you reuse the experience, you might revise that case, and then you store it for further learning. What does this mean, coming back to the clinical data and the patient records? Here's a patient record, or medical report for a patient. In the first step, we extract here the metadata, we scan all the text and we mark the relevant sections. We extract that. Imagine you are looking at a specific picture. On a fingerprint, you would be able to get all the relevant literature, and the computer would compare and find out if there have been any similar cases before, any patients who had a similar looking picture or a similar patient record. How does this work? Of course, we get all the medical information. Then we try to understand the image and annotate the image. We really did something which is very similar to that what Dr. Shamil showed us this morning. We put the whole system on an iPad. And additionally, we also put a speech interface on it. And the system which was developed by the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence is called Red Speech. So a doctor is able to talk to his iPad he can get all the literature and compare all these different cases really to get the right information at the right time to solve here the health issue here with this specific patient. So, okay, this is reality. This is as of today. This is what is working now. The question is, where do we move? What, what, is, what is really really the next. And I have, I have two things I would like to talk about. If we talk about all, all this data and, and all these devices which are out there, I'm absolutely sure that really monitoring our own, own health condition will be very usual very soon. We will be able to monitor 24 hours, seven days a week our health condition. And there's a movement out there which is called quantified self. If you have never heard that term, remember it and Google it, because there are already people out there who monitor their own health condition. They track how long they sleep, they track what they eat, they track their, all their physical activities, and they get something like a personal health score. So on a good day, you might say, okay, my health score of today has improved by 20. On a bad day, you said, my personal health score has decreased by 50. And studies show that the difficulty with health-related behavior is that you do something wrong today, but you will get the negative effect years later. So if you get that instant feedback, people might really change the health-related behavior earlier. But what is much more important, if you think about that all this self-monitoring will become mainstream, really think about all the data we are getting, all the data which might fuel back into medical research, because really getting all these data we heard these days is, is really, really difficult. There was the question about privacy of that data. Imagine we could put on a service which gives me a pre-warning about one hour before I get a heart attack. Would I care about privacy about my data if this really would work? Or I get a pre-warning, I would get a stroke in one hour, and this is really reliable. Would I provide my data? Of course I would. Let's collect that data and see what we can achieve really with that data. Where will it finally go? 
And we heard that only also this morning from Dr. Jamil, and that's, I think, why, why we like each other so much, because we have the same opinion about these things, is my, my deep understanding and my deep belief as a technologist, not really coming from medical, but as a computer science person, I think that the same technology was brought out, these personalized ad on the internet, will bring us personalized healthcare. Really think about if we would be able to research all the medical literature online, on, on our fingertips. We would be able to compare the patient's data not only with 500 or 1,000 other patients, we would be able to compare that with millions of patients recording all the data online. So there is very often the probability that things happened before. If we can find that information and bring that to the patient, that would be, be a real revolution. I started with talking about uh, the smart machines. When IBM started with that, the results had not been very good. So they have not been really encouraging. But they worked on it, and after five years, they beaten two human champions live on TV. I'm, I'm really not an expert, and, and I'm not able to predict what will happen in the future. But I can say two things absolutely sure. So the first thing is, I'm sure that this kind of technology will not bring us that far as I personally would hope. That's for sure. But I'm also for sure that the medical community, that you, that the researcher, that all that smart guys out there, if you have all that data, I'm sure you can achieve a lot out of the data and, and improve that, and much more than you think as of today. And I'm looking forward to that, and I would like to say thank you for your patience. And I say it's some time. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. <laughs>